right, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome in across the continent and beyond. My name is Jesse, and a big welcome back to another exciting program with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Now, some of you classes have been in for like 30 of these this year, which is awesome. We've been going to some of the coolest places on planet Earth. But if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, everything we do goes live to YouTube, so you can check this out in three weeks, in three years. You can check out like 500 other coral programs, or over 3,000 programs since we started back in 2014. Lots of opportunity to keep the learning going. Now, before I go live with our speaker, and I'm so excited for you all today, I want to note we do have a Kahoot quiz together. For those who've never done this before, you can type in Kahoot.it and use this game pin below to play a little four-question quiz with us between the talk and the Q&A. If you don't want to play, that's fine. You can just yell out the answers in your classes, but it's an extra chance to keep it interactive uh, in about 20, 25 minutes. After that, I'm really excited for all your questions, and I'm sure you will have a ton because this is an awesome program. Now, we are bringing back for the third time, Dr. Lamont. Now, Tim Lamont is uh, gets to do the coolest job in the world. Now, we have some of the coolest people on planet Earth all the time in our broadcast, and even by that standard, Tim's job is amazing. Have you ever gone into like a forest and like listen for some of the things you can hear, birds, song, insects, whatever? Well, Tim gets to do that on coral reefs. He seeks to understand the habitats on some of these most incredible biodiverse places on planet Earth and use that knowledge to help protect them and conserve them and bring them back. Some of you kids will know a lot of coral reefs are under a lot of threats around the world. And through Tim's research, we're working to help mitigate that and change it for the better. So if there's a better topic than that, I don't know what it is. I'm excited to welcome in Dr. Lamont to share some of his amazing work providing hope for wildlife. I hope you're as excited as I am. And without further ado, Tim, thanks so much for joining us again, man. Welcome back to the broadcast. Thank you. Really brilliant to be here. Be best part of my week. Been looking forward to this for ages. <laughs> well, I know you've got a lot to share with us. If you want to dive right in with the presentation, I've got it queued up and you are good to go, man. Thank you very much. And uh, and thank you for joining us today, everybody. It's really exciting to be spending a little bit of time talking and thinking and asking questions about coral reefs. Uh, I think they're some of the world's most precious most special ecosystems and it's really important that we understand them better and learn to protect them better. Um, so I'm going to share some of my research um, and what I do then I'd love to hear from you as well, love to hear your questions, um, we'll have a bit of a quiz at the end uh, and we're all going to have a lot of fun thinking and learning about these amazing places. So to start with uh, let's load up the live chat. It would be great if we could hear where you're watching from. Um, so, so get your teachers to type in or type in yourself if, if you've got access and, and tell us where you're coming from. Uh, while you do that, I'm going to tell you a bit about where I'm coming from um, and what I do as a job. So I'm a marine biologist. I think that's the best job in the world, um, but I'm biased, of course, because it's what I do. Um, but one of the reasons why this job is so exciting for me to do is because I get to spend time with some of the world's most amazing animals underwater. So up in the top left there of your screen, uh, that's when I came across the biggest fish in the sea. Uh, that's a fish called a whale shark. It's about the size of a school bus. And, and swimming with a fish that size is just incredible. Um, on the top right, that's a big fish called a potato cod in Australia. That one was very curious. Uh, it came right over to me and sort of nuzzled itself right into my stomach, uh, made me get out of the way. Uh, in the bottom left, that's hanging out underwater with a green turtle. Um, those are animals that can hold their breath underwater for hours, literally hours. Um, I can only hold my breath underwater for about two minutes, so I couldn't spend long um, before I had to go back to the surface. Um, and then on the right there, I'm on a boat there, leaning over the front, um, and this is in the UK where I live, uh, spending time with a, a common dolphin. So there's some amazing animals you can spend time with underwater, and they're wonderful animals to research and to study. Um, go to lots of different places as well. Um, so coral reefs, that's the picture on the right and the picture at the bottom there, exploring different coral reefs. And then also freshwater systems, so exploring an underwater cave in Mexico on the left and exploring the Arctic Ocean uh, in the middle up on top. Um, here's some more pictures from those different places on, on the top, uh, listening out for whales underneath the ice in the Arctic. Uh, and at the bottom there, um, using some, some complicated equipment to take sound recordings of coral reefs. Um, more about that later. So we've got people coming in from Canada in the chat. That's great. And Wisconsin, um, people from all over North America. So brilliant to have you all here. 
Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, re really exciting to have everyone together. Now, I, I wonder if anybody knows which countries in the world have coral reefs. So type them in. That, that There's a lot of them. There's lots of right answers here. Um, and it'd be great to hear um, hear what you've got on this. Jesse. You know what? I can actually bring in the classes and see if they want to yell it out as well. So I'm going to head to our Janesville, Wisconsin crew. What do we think, fourth graders? Countries with coral reefs. Do you have any ideas? Shout it out. Australia. Australia. We got that in the chat too. Everyone's saying Australia. Very, very good. Miss Lou's class, fourth graders. What do we think? Australia. I think everyone wants to go to Australia for vacation. I think winter setting in in North America. We're all getting a little sad. Uh, Boulder, Colorado. What do we think? Third graders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, Mexico. 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 Miss Hurley, if you want to flick on your bike, one more class live. One more class live, Miss Hurley, London, Ontario. Any thoughts on coral reefs? They would. They put Australia in the chat. Anything else? What do we think? They're saying Hawaii. Hawaii to the United States. Nice, Tim. Those are some great answers, man. <laughs> yeah, those are brilliant answers. Yeah. So, so I was chatting to colleagues who work on coral reefs in Hawaii just this morning. Uh, and, and later on in the show, I'll show you some experiments that we did in Australia um, and some other places all around the world. So co coral reefs, you can find them all around the world in, in, um, in the tropics. So basically anywhere it's hot and you've got a seashore, you're quite likely to find a coral reef. Um, but that begs the question, what is a coral? Uh, and this is actually a surprisingly difficult question to answer, um, but because typically we, you, you know, that there's this this game you can play, isn't there, where you, you classify everything as being either a plant or an animal or, an, or a mineral, whereas, in fact, a, a coral doesn't play by the rules in this game. A coral is in some ways an animal, but it also has elements of a plant in it, and in some ways it's a mineral as well. It's a rock. Um, so it's a really, really interesting um, interesting thing to study. And let me explain exactly how it's all of those things. So to start with, the coral itself is an animal, okay? The, the, the coral animal is a very small animal and it's just like a jellyfish, except it's, it's a, like an upside down jellyfish is the best way to think about it. Okay, so just like a jellyfish, it's got these stinging tentacles uh, that it uses to catch very tiny things in the water that it can eat as its prey. But as well as that, it's got these plants that live inside the animal. OK, so as well as catching food with its tentacles and eating that, it can also photosynthesize just like a plant because it's got these tiny plants that live inside the coral animal. They're called zooxanthellae, these little plants, and they allow the coral to photosynthesize. So it can get energy from the sun and it can get energy by catching animals in its tentacles. And then as well as that, it's an animal with a plant inside it that makes rock, right? So it, so it can do this clever chemical reaction where it takes um, calcium and carbonate ions out of the water and it makes its own rock skeleton. Quite an amazing thing to be able to do. And so the actual reef part of the coral reef is loads and loads of limestone rock that is made by the animals. So a coral reef is a, a big rock structure made of limestone that's been created by these coral animals that live by living like jellyfish with their tentacles, but also they have plants inside them. So in some ways, a, a coral is like a, an animal and a plant and a rock. They're amazing, amazing animals. And you get absolutely loads of them all together. Uh, and they look something like this. So you can see on the right, there's a picture of a close up coral. And what you can see there, those little things that look a bit like flowers, those are the tentacles of the coral animal, all poked out into the water, looking for stuff to catch and feed on. And then that's the coral reef taken from a zoomed out picture. So you can see lots of different types of coral in that picture, lots of different shapes. There's ones with, with branches. There's ones that look like little bushes. There's ones that look like sort of big flower petals or big plates or bowls. And there's lots of colors as well. So in that picture, you can see yellow corals, some greens in the background, some purples, some oranges, some reds. So corals come in lots of different shapes and colors and sizes. They make coral reefs a very colorful place to swim. But as well as what you can see on a coral reef, you can hear a lot on a coral reef. And that's because there's lots of different animals that make lots of weird and wonderful sounds on the reef. So when you're swimming around a coral reef, as well as looking out for stuff, you have to remember to listen for things as well. 
so, so I've taken a bunch of recordings of some of the animals that live on coral reefs, uh, and I'm going to play them for you now. Uh, you, you might want to think about what these recordings sound like, you know, what, what other sound effects or maybe what animals do these different fish sound like. So the first one is, is this fish up in the top left. It's a, a little bright yellow little fish called an Ambon damselfish. Uh, and it sounds like this. Anyone, anyone know what that sounds like? Any ideas? What, what would you compare that sound of an Ambon damselfish to? I don't know. For me, it certainly sounds very bird-like or something that I hear at night or like an owl maybe. Uh, but if anyone wants to chime in in the chat, we can... You guys have been really quick in the chat. What do we think? Oh, Janesville, they're like all oh, pumping their fists. What do we think? Wisconsin. Owl. 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 Very owlish. Okay, we, we all agree. That's nice. Thank you for making me feel better about my pick. Sounds like an owl. Nice, nice. Miss Hurley's class saying it sounds like dripping water. I, I can see that as well. It's, it's that sort of high pitch sound, isn't it? Well, how about this one? This one sounds quite different. So, so this is from the fish in the top right. They're called Sergeant Majors. And they sound, uh, they sound like this. What do we think? Ooh. Anyone know what that sounds like? Yeah, Miss Lou's class. You guys are right at the computer. I can bring you in, uh, fourth graders. What do we think? Like a shower. Oh, there you go. Toilet, running water, flushing toilet. Very, very flushing water toilet. after our classes. Yeah. Nice. Very bathroom themed answers. I like it. Like a waterfall. I like that too. <laughs> Some people have said it sounds a bit like a cat purring as well. Um, I don't have a cat, so I wouldn't know very well, but someone with a cat said it sounded a bit like their cat. Anyway, now this fish in the bottom left, this is called the reef croaker, and here's what it sounds like. Any comparisons? What do we what do we reckon we compare Ooh, that to? I have one that jumps straight to mind, but uh Boulder, Colorado, Miss Rikovsky's class, what do we think? Woodpecker! Woodpecker. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> woodpecker ever knocking on a door. Nice, I like that. Very cool. Nice, nice. So, some of the people I work with thinks it sounds a bit like a drum. Bubbles popping from Miss Lou's class. I like that as well. That's good. So, so that's a really interesting one because that fish is making that sound with a bag of air that's inside its stomach, and it has a special muscle that when it tenses that muscle, it like slams against the bag of air and literally drums against that bag of air in the fish's stomach. So it's almost like it's got a little mini drum in its own stomach. It's a really, really cool fish. And then this next one, this, this is a sound from a nose strike clownfish. So a, a type of clownfish. Have a listen to this one, see what you think it sounds like. What, what about that? What do we think? Ooh, Miss Hurley's class. I know you've been really quick in the chat, but if you want to flick on your mic, you can yell it out as well. You're the one who hasn't come in uh, on sort of audio yet. YouTubers, what do we think, Miss Hurley's class? They're yelling at a woodpecker. Woodpecker again. We got all the woodpeckers in the scene. Another, right? another woodpecker, a different type of woodpecker. Or maybe a woodpecker, woodpecker pecking a different type of tree. Um, yeah, that, that's great stuff. And now here's a couple of sounds that you'll have to help me with because... All those four I've played you so far, we know what type of fish make the sound. But these next ones, are, they're still a mystery. So we don't know what fish make these sound. I've just recorded them on a coral reef and we've not yet worked out who's making the sound. So tell me what you think this one sounds like. Any ideas for that sound? What would you compare Ooh. that to? I think it kind of sounds like a seal in distress. A seal in distress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my dog, if my dog sounded like that, I think he was kind of sick, maybe. Flush, flushing toilet again. We've got yeah. a very toilet themed crew today. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, but bathtub playtime. Nice. We'll call it the bathtub playtime fish. I like that. <laughs> Amazing, Great. guys. And, and and then here's another one. Oh, this is a mix. So that, that's a mix of all the different sounds you can hear on a coral reef all put together. And, and that gives you a sense of, of how, how amazingly different all the sounds you can hear on these reefs are. Somebody there has said it sounds like the rainforest. And, and that's a really good way of thinking about it, because it does in the same way that the rainforest has all sorts of different animals and birds and insects and bats all making different noises. The, the underwater rainforest, the coral reef, also has loads of animals that make lots of different types of sound. And when we put all of that together, 
there's a there's a word we use to describe that whole mix of sounds and it's called the soundscape maybe jesse can put that word up on the screen for us um the soundscape of a coral reef is all the mixture of all these different sounds and a healthy coral reef will have loads of different um, animals on it, making lots of different types of noise, and it's called a soundscape. Nice. Coral reefs around the world are threatened though, and, and you'll know about this, I think you'll have heard about this in the news maybe, but um, we, as climate change gets worse and worse, coral reefs get hit by more and more of these threats to reefs all over the world. So strong cyclones on the left, that's a picture of a reef that's just been damaged by a cyclone, and you can see like when a cyclone hits land, the same thing happens when it hits these shallow water coral reefs, just breaks everything up, turns everything upside down, really destroys the reef. And, and then the other thing that can happen as a result of climate change is coral bleaching. And that's where the temperature gets too high. Those the water temperature that is gets too high. Those little plants that live inside the coral that I told you about before, they leave the coral, that breaks down, the coral can't photosynthesize anymore, it turns white, it gets really sick and eventually it dies. So climate change is a real problem for coral reefs but because of these two things. It makes more cyclones and it makes more coral bleaching and the reef really suffers as a result. Here's some other pictures of really damaged reefs that I've, I've seen and I've worked on. These pictures are, are both pictures that I took in Australia on a reef that had just been hit by both cyclones and coral bleaching. It was really, really damaged. And you can see how sad it looks. When you compare that to the pictures earlier, there's, there's no color there. Um, there's not much life there at all. None of the fishes are there anymore. It's, it's really quite a sad place to be. And so what we need to, to work out um, for, for the future of coral reefs now is, is how we can stop climate change, how we can stop that happening to, to prevent these threats to reefs. And then also where reefs have been damaged, we need to work out how we can restore those reefs, how we can rebuild them. So that's some of the work I'm doing now. I'm working with colleagues in a place called Indonesia. Uh, so Indonesia is a country in Asia. No, nobody mentioned it before um, when I asked how, what countries around the world have have coral reefs? Indonesia isn't often the first one that comes to people's minds. Um, nobody mentioned it before, but it's actually the country in the world which has the most coral. Indonesia has more coral reefs than any other country on the planet, more than Australia, more than Mexico, more than Hawaii. Uh, and as well as that, Indonesia has a amazing number of people all doing amazing things to work on new ways of restoring coral reefs. So you can see on the right, that's a screenshot of a, a newspaper clipping that Indonesia is leading the way in restoring coral reefs. And on the left, um, that's a picture of a scientist that I'm very fortunate to work with. We work together. She's called Dr. Trias Razak, um, and she's one of Indonesia's foremost experts in restoring coral reefs. So together we we work on ways to try and um, try and come up with ways of rebuilding damaged reefs, replacing some of the coral that's died. And this is one of the projects that we collaborate with. So this is a project run by uh, someone called Mars Sustainable Solutions. Um, and they've got these these frames that you can see here on the picture, uh, the, these metal frames that they cover in sand. And then they tie lots of tiny little pieces of baby corals all over the frames. And then, so, th so those are two frames there in that guy's hands with lots of little corals tied onto them. And then they swim them down to the bottom of the sea in areas where the coral has been damaged. Uh, and they plant them down there. They, they stake them into the ground nice and strong um, and plant the corals down there. And at first it looks like this, lots of metal frames all over the seabed with little tiny corals um, planted on them. But then the beauty of it is the coral then starts to grow. And the coral grows really well because it's got this lovely framework on which to grow. It grows really quickly. And before you know it, it starts to look like this. You can barely see any of the metal frames anymore because the coral has grown so well. Uh, and it becomes this new reef that's been established by people planting little tiny fragments of coral, a bit like gardening. In fact, lots of people call it coral gardening as a process. So there's this wonderful way in which when a coral reef has been damaged, we can try and, and rebuild it and restore it. 
again, there's, an, there's another few pictures of these restored coral reefs. So these areas used to be damaged rubble fields, and now they've got lots of coral all over them again. Uh, so that's a great project in Indonesia. And if you'd like to find out more about it, you can go on uh, you can go on buildingcoral.com. Uh, there's a whole project website where you can see lots more pictures like this and some videos of, of how they replant this coral and how the reefs regrow. Um, and, and then uh, there's another experiment that we did. This is some work we did in Australia um, that I'd like to tell you about. So this was coming out of the challenge for when we're trying to rebuild reefs, it's one thing to replant the corals, right? And, and bring the coral back. But we also need to bring those fish back, um, those fish that were making all those noises before that we were talking about. And, and that can be a tricky thing um, because we needed to know, well, how do fish choose where to live? And, and how would a fish know when you've replanted the coral? How would it find your reef? How would it choose to come to your reef and, and set up shop and start its life again on your new restored reef? Uh, and the answer is to do with those noises we heard before. So all of these noises again, as we talked about, they make a soundscape. And it turns out that fish can hear that soundscape. And fish really like the sound of a healthy coral reef soundscape. Because when a fish hears all those noises, it thinks that must be a good place to live. That's a really healthy coral reef. Uh, we'll swim over there and, and start our life there. So we thought, well, if we can replant the coral, maybe we can use underwater loudspeakers to then advertise these new reefs, to play the sounds of a healthy coral reef, uh, to, to advertise the reef, tell fish in the area, we've planted these corals, come over this way, that they'll swim over, attracted by the sound of this healthy coral reef and, and settle. So we did this experiment where we took these underwater loudspeakers, that, that's me there swimming through the water, holding an, an underwater loudspeaker, and we planted them all around these, um, th this island in Australia, this island called Lizard Island. And uh, all those dots are, are a place where I, I made a little habitat patch um, and I set up a loudspeaker, either playing the sound of a, a healthy coral reef, I called that acoustic enrichment, or I didn't put a loudspeaker there, or I put a loudspeaker there, but I didn't turn it on, I'm just, just doing nothing. So that was like uh, to see whether it made a difference having the loudspeaker playing the sound or not. And, and here's what we found. There's some more pictures of the setting up underwater loudspeakers on coral reefs. Uh, and, and on this graph on the left, I'm going to show you what happened. So first, when I put no loudspeaker on a habitat patch, after about a month, 25 fish, an average of 25 fish had, had come and started living on that habitat. And when I put a dummy loudspeaker, which so there was a loudspeaker there, but I didn't turn it on and it wasn't playing any sounds. Then, as you'd expect, it was the same. About 25 fish came and settled on those reefs. But when we did acoustic enrichment, so when we played the sounds of a healthy coral reef, then we got twice the number of fish arriving and, and setting up shop on these new habitat patches. We got about 50 or maybe even 60 fish um, arriving. So it really worked by playing the sounds of these healthy coral reefs, we found that we can alter fish behavior. They come and, and swim over and are really interested and, and stay there and, and set up their lives on these new habitat patches. Um, and that might be a really useful tool that we could use when we're restoring coral reefs in the future. So quick summary, coral reefs are amazingly diverse beautiful, colourful and very noisy places, the wonderful places and very precious ecosystems all around the world. They're made up of these amazing animals that are sort of a bit like a jellyfish, but have plants inside of them and make their own rock skeletons beneath them. So really unique, special animals. They're very damaged by climate change. Uh, cyclones and coral bleaching are both caused by climate change and they're a big problem for coral reefs. So we need to stop climate change and we also really need to learn ways of rebuilding and restoring damaged coral reefs. And there are lots of programs around the world like this one where we can plant coral uh, and that coral can regrow. And then we can also use the research that we do and the things that we understand about fish biology to try and bring fish back as well. 
So thank you very much. Been a total pleasure sharing what I do. Uh, and now I think we're going to go to a bit of a quiz. Are we, Jesse? Is that right? We, we are indeed, Tim. And thank you so much for that captivating talk, as always. Uh, what a pleasure having you on. What cool research. Honestly, like professional detachment out the window. I love hearing about this every time. I've had the chance to hear from you a few times now, and it still blows my mind every time. So, uh, yeah, I'm so glad our students get to hear it for the first time today. And as Tim mentioned, we are going to go into our Kahoot. And again, some of you, if you don't want to bring this up as a separate tab, that's totally fine. We're going to do a four-question quiz together. I put up the game pin. You can pull this up, and uh, we're going to get started. The faster you answer, the more points you get. And what you win is Tim and I's everlasting respect. So I think that's worth quite a bit. And then we're going to go to Q&A. So if it's news class, we're coming to you first when we do Q&A. Uh, but we're going to get started with this really quick. Let's uh, do it together, folks. And I'm so glad so many of you are in. You can keep coming in after I start. It's totally fine. All right. Question number one. Tim, you can help us with uh, some hints when there's a few seconds left for each of these if you'd like to, too. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in with some hints. Okay. Question one. Coral is most closely related to, it's the thing that's most related to coral, just like dogs and wolves are related, tigers and lions. Is coral most closely related to squid, jellyfish, fish, or sea stars? Ooh, this is Great stuff. A one. So, so if you remember, the coral is related to an upside down version of this animal. Yeah, 20 answers in so far. This is a tricky one. A lot of adults have a hard time with this too, but it is jellyfish. And most of you got that right. That's fantastic. Let's see how, what that does to our leaderboard. Rapid Lark starts in our lead. Okay, nicely done. We'll go to question two. Coral reefs make up about 2% of the world's ocean habitat. What percentage of the world's fish live on them? So is it oh. 2%? Is it the same amount as there are coral? Is it 10%? Is it 25 or is it 90%? Now, yeah, have, we'll have some good guesses on this one, I think. Worth I think remembering, so. corals live in the tropics. So that's some of the busiest places in the world. But corals don't live all over the world. Yep. That was a great hint. So uh, most of you got this right. It is 25%. A quarter of all fish life live on coral reefs. So 10 times the percentage, basically, uh, live on these special, special habitats. Very cool, Tim. All right. Changes our leaderboard. Awesome B takes our lead. Let's go to question three of four. When coral algae depart due to stress, maybe it's too hot, maybe there's uh, too acidic in the water. They leave and it leaves the coral really white. We did have this up as a name on screen. Is it skeletonizing, bleaching, decoloring, or dying entirely? Yeah, so th this happens when it when it gets really hot and that plant living inside the coral, that, that leaves and the coral turns white. Can you remember what that was called? Yeah, let's see. Oh, most of you got this right. It's bleaching and I put up Zuzenthele. Those are the guys that leave and leave it white. They're the ones with all those colors. Very good, kids. All right. Nimble Giraffe takes a, a tiny lead over Awesome B. Going to question four. This is so intense. Okay. So, Tim talked about this. What happened when scientists play the sound of healthy reefs on degraded ones? Does nothing happen? Doesn't change anything? It sends the fish away. They're like, oh, it's already full on the reef. I don't want to come. Or it doubles the rate that the fish return. What do we think? And thanks for our chat crew, too. Hmm. Yeah, oh, what, what was the result? What did we show you in that graph there? When we played the sound of healthy reefs, we called that acoustic enrichment. Yeah, well done. Loads of people getting that one right. I think the best analogy for people here, ask your parents if they went to a restaurant and there was a lot of noise in the restaurant, if they'd want to go in versus if it was incredibly quiet and there was no one in the restaurant. You probably want to go into a place with lots of people because it means it's a pretty good place to be. So our winner, Nimble Giraffe won. Oh, way to go, everybody. Thank you for participating. Let us know who you are in the chat. And Miss uh, Rukowski's class, thanks for playing along in the uh, the chat as well. That was awesome. Um, that was super close result, Jesse. Only 30 points there between first and second. <laughs> we had a dead heat the other day, like a tie for first and second. That was very intense. It, it's wow. getting crazy in our cahoots now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to head to Miss Lou's class to kick us off. Milton grade fours, come on in and uh, take us away. Hi. How do coral reefs start in the first place? Ooh. Oh, brilliant question. Really, really good question. So, so coral reefs start in lots of different ways. Um, co coral, when corals reproduce, they they put their eggs out, these the eggs and then the tiny little baby baby corals are called planulae, and they go out into the open ocean and they swim around in the open ocean for a couple of days, sometimes a couple of weeks. 
uh, and, and they're looking for somewhere new to settle. Uh, and if they find somewhere that, that works for them, that's right, um, somewhere with a bit of bare rock, nice clean water, nice warm shallow water where they can get some sunlight, then they'll land there and, and they'll start um, start growing. And, and new reefs can start like that. So, so if a, a coral reproduces, the baby corals go out into the open ocean, they carry it on ocean currents, and then they land somewhere new. That can be the start of a new coral reef. Very cool question. Thanks, guys. Miss Lewis Glass, I'll also note Ripley's Aquarium of Canada, not too far from you, has some baby corals and have aquarists that can talk about some of this process if you want to see it firsthand as well, which is pretty cool. Um, let's head to Van Buren Elementary, Janesville, Wisconsin. Come on in, fourth graders, and take us away. Hi, guys. Uh, how does the ocean waters get so warm? Ooh, yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so when the ocean waters are overheating at the moment, that's largely due to climate change. So, so that's due to um, people's carbon dioxide emissions um, causing global warming, um, and the, the whole ocean is heating up because of that. Yeah. We had uh, waters off the coast of Florida this year that were like hot tub level, which is just unprecedented in the history of the world. Like, I mean, you you kids are growing up with this. Tim and I grew up in an era where this was, it was sort of like, oh, this will happen in the future. And, you know, we'll see what happens by 2050. And you're growing up in a time where a lot of these things that you're, what you consider normal weather is very, very different from how we grew up. So you should ask your parents, ask your teachers. I mean, where I used to live is radically different 20 years ago than it is now. And that is because of our impact. So I'm really glad we got the climate change question. And this is something that a lot of coral reef researchers around the world are really working on trying to solve because it's a big challenge for coral and for the oceans in general. So, yeah, re real big challenge. And, and it's these these marine heat waves, especially, are, are, are happening because of climate change. And, and that's what we've had in Florida this last year, these, these super, super strong marine heat waves. But it's, it's an important challenge for scientists today and also a massively important challenge for your generation. I, I really think so, some of you watching today, some of you in these classes will be the next generation of scientists, of politicians, of um, journalists, of whatever you want to be, but but you know people that have a really profoundly positive impact on solving this problem. I'm so glad you phrased it this way because I think a lot of the news and kids, you'll know this. It, it tends to be very negative. Oh, this bad thing is happening. Another bad thing is happening. And, you know, there are bad things happening in the world, but it also represents like the greatest opportunity for innovation in like human history. So it's a really exciting time to be a scientist, to be a conservationist. There are a lot of amazing people doing great work. And I really want to drive that point home in our broadcast. So thank you for that, Tim. Um, we're going to head to our third graders in Boulder, Colorado. And then Miss Hurley, I'm coming to you right after. YouTubers, don't be shy either. We'll do a whole other round after that, too. So lots of questions to come. But Miss Rikoski's class, welcome in. Hi. Yeah. Hi. What happens if a fish eats dying coral? Ooh. Would it affect the fish? Does it affect the fish? Yeah. Yeah, re really good question. So different fish specialize on eating different things. So there are some fish, for example, a butterfly fish you might have heard of. It specializes in eating living coral, right? And, and it, it eats those little jellyfish-like coral animals, and it does well out of that. Whereas there are some other fish, like some types of parrotfish, that actually prefer to eat dead coral. And th the reason that is, is because inside dead coral, there's these bacteria and other microorganisms that the parrotfish can get a lot of energy out of. So it deliberately eats dead coral. And then some fish don't eat coral at all. They eat other animals or they eat algae or they eat plants or they eat other fish. And, and so it, it depends on the type of fish, really. If, if some fish, if, if they tried to eat dead coral and they weren't specialized in that, then that would be very bad. But other fish love eating dead coral. So all fish are different, really. Yeah, fantastic question, guys. This is a great Q&A. Um, we're going to head to Miss Hurley's class, London, Ontario. If you guys want to unmute your mic and share a question, then we'll go right back to Miss Lou right after that. Hey, Miss Hurley's class. Hi. Uh, do the metal frames used to restore coral reefs become garbage after? Great question. Really good question. Yeah, these are great questions, Jesse. Um, so yeah, so, so that's a really good and a really important question. If you do it wrong, then then yes, there's a danger of that. If, if you do a bad job of anchoring them to the seabed, then next time a big wave comes, they'll get dislodged and loose and they'll blow all over the sea and they'll wash up on a beach somewhere and, and they will become garbage, basically. So we need to be really careful when we do this restoration. But if you do it right, if you really anchor those, those frames down really nicely, 
what happens is they stay there, whatever the weather, and the coral grows around them and the coral grows through them and it grows over them. And in some cases, the coral even engulfs them entirely because the coral will grow around the whole leg of the thing. And the metal frame literally becomes a part of the coral skeleton. And it's not garbage. It, it then becomes basically completely invisible because it's basically a, an integral part of the reef itself. So really good question. And it's one we're thinking about as we're trying to design the, the build of these restored systems. Yeah, I've even read, uh, we got a program later this month again with Julie Burwald who featured a lot of this coral work. And some of the kids, if you look really closely, might notice that they use zip ties to tie the baby coral onto the thing. And they're trying to find zip ties that'll be biodegradable and will sort of become part of the reef as opposed to something that's plastic. So these are issues. We don't want to be littering in the oceans, of course. This is a big problem in the world. But ultimately, you know, in the scheme of things, not only everything Tim mentioned, but the fact that we want to rebuild coral reefs, it's more important to do that no matter what the thing might be. Um, but I love that you're thinking on that sort of multifaceted angle. So thanks, Miss Hurley. All right, classes, we're going to whip through another round. Stick around for a few more minutes. Miss Lou's class, fourth graders, come on back in. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, so when coral dies, does the fish that lives in it die too? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so, sometimes the answer is yes. So sometimes the, the coral is really important um, for that ecosystem. And if there's no coral, then, then the ecosystem can't survive. The fish need somewhere to live. They need something to eat. And, and so they'll either move away, go somewhere else, or they'll die. Um, there are other cases where the fish can find a way to survive if there's good protection nearby or there's another habitat they can go and live in um, or, or, or there's some other solution they can find. So, so it depends a little bit. Um, but, but what's for certain is that when the coral dies, we lose a lot of diversity and we lose a lot of habitat. Uh, and those two things can be real problems for fish. Yeah. Imagine if you lost your home. And I mean, this is something that no one really wants to think about. But if you didn't have a home, ideally, you'd be in a situation where you could go to another home. But it's a real challenge in some situations in some places around the world in coral reefs. So this has been a great Q&A. I love these questions, everyone. You guys are so on the ball. Um, Van Buren, we're going to head back to Wisconsin. Come on back in. We're going to Colorado right after that. Hey, guys. Okay, go ahead. How does the trash get into the water? Ooh. Yeah, good, good question. So, so marine pollution is is quite a big problem. Lots of trash in the water in 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 lots of different places, and some of it ends up in the middle of the ocean, doesn't it? You you see these pictures of of litter and trash like middle of the ocean, miles away from land. It's like, how on earth did that get there? Um, and I think it comes from different places. Some of it comes from people littering on the beach, but other times it can come from people littering like in the mountains or in a city and then it'll fall into a river and then it gets swept down the river into the sea and then it can get carried on these ocean currents all over the sea it doesn't really matter where it started because the ocean's all moving so when i showed you those pictures of working in the arctic ocean like right up near the north pole we were like thousands of miles away from where anybody lived we were still finding trash there so, so that tells you how important it is that we need to think about where our trash goes. When you throw it in the bin, you know, where's it going next? Because everything's connected. It can go down the river. It can get carried around the oceans. It could end up at the North Pole. It could end up on a coral reef. That's why it's so important to think about what rubbish we're producing and how we're getting rid of it in a responsible way. On a positive note, kids these days are really attuned to this. A lot of you pack litterless lunches. A lot of you know to have a reusable water bottle. Like these things really do make a difference and prevent trash ending up in these really special, pristine places. But I want to encourage everyone to look up a really cool project in terms of keeping uh, trash from getting to the oceans by blocking it at rivers called Mr. Trash Wheel. This is one of my favorite things we've ever featured on the broadcast. So everyone should look up Mr. Trash Wheel when you're done the program because it's very cool. It's in the Baltimore Harbor for our American friends. Check that out when you're done if you want to see how we can keep plastic away from coral reefs. All right, Boulder, we're heading to you, and then I'm going to take one from YouTube, Miss Hurley, and then we're going to wrap up with a big thank you and farewell in about four or five minutes, but come on in, Ms. Rikoski. Hi, third graders. Hello. Which type of coral is the most extinct? Ooh, Which type of extinct? coral is the most extinct? Yeah. Oh, so the, yeah. So, so there's lots of different types of coral, um, and and lots of some of them are very common. Some of them are really rare, um, and and they grow in different ways as well. So some grow really fast. They're really easy to plant. Really easy to to 
bring back the population when it's threatened, some of them grow really, really slowly. So in terms of which are the most threatened, I, I would probably say some of those slow growing corals, just because if we lose them, then they can take hundreds of years to grow back. They're really, really hard to bring back. So, so some of those slow ones are corals. I mean, they've got names like parites, um, or they've got names like Favia, um, they've got names like Diplastrea, you know, lots of complicated names, uh, but they're really, some of them grow really slowly. And those are the ones we really have to protect because it's so hard to grow them back once they've died. I love these questions. Thank you so, so much, everyone. We're going to take two more quick ones. Uh, Miss Reed's class joining us in LaGrange, Ohio. Welcome in Keystone Elementary. They want to know, do turtles live in or depend on coral reefs, Tim? They do, yeah. There's, there's seven different types of sea turtle around the world, um, and, you, and you see several of them on coral reefs. So there's a sea turtle called a green sea turtle. You'll see a lot on coral reefs. There's one called a hawksbill turtle that you see a lot on coral reefs as well. They're really amazing to see. Hawksbill turtles are really cool. They've got these they big beak like a hawk and they crunch through corals and, and you can you can hear them coming. Just chomp, 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 chomp. Cool. These, these turtles going around the reef. Hawksbills are my favorite. Don't tell the leatherback or green sea turtles. We actually released sea turtles live in Nicaragua earlier today. So that was really cool. We were talking wow. about there. Um, but just a really special turtle. I'll bring up the name in a minute so you can all look for them when you're done. But we're going to head to Miss Hurley's for one final question. Unmute your mic, folks, and then we're going to bring in all you classes for a big thank you and farewell. London, Ontario, though. Wrap us up. Hey, guys. What can we do to help coral reefs? The best question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely brilliant question. Um, I think you can do two things to help coral reefs, two really important things. And, and the first thing is, is think about what you as an individual and what your family and what your friends, think about what impact you're having on the world. Think about what, what litter you're, you're saving. How, how can you use less plastic, use less litter, throw less stuff in the bin. Think about how you can have less carbon emissions you know, could you walk or cycle somewhere rather than taking a car? Could you reduce your carbon emissions? Have a chat to your family about that. And then the second thing you can do is think about what you want to do with your life when, when you grow up, because you've got a whole life ahead of you guys. And, and with, the, with the brain power and the imagination and the creativity and the determination that you've got, you really could change this world. You, you could go on to be scientists like me. You could go on to be educators and teachers and tell other people about this stuff you could go on to be lawyers or politicians or or artists or so many different career paths but but in each whatever career path you take there will be a way in which you can make a really positive difference to the way we look after each other and the way we look after this planet and i think that's probably the most important thing you can do for coral reefs Tim, that is a fantastic answer. Thank you so much for sharing your passion, your expertise with us again. I really encourage our classes. Check out buildingcoral.com. So much to explore there. Tim's work is really amazing. And of course, we'll have to have him back on in the future. So you'll have to come and join again to be talking even more coral reef stuff. Check this out. Share it with your family and friends on YouTube. The more people know about coral reefs, their plight, and the things we're doing to help save them, the better the world will be. Uh, classes, we're going to bring you all in to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Miss Hurley's class, if you want to unmute your mic, Miss Rikowski, Miss Sillar's class, Miss Lou's class, joining us at home, Miss Reed's class in Ohio. Please, thank you so please, much, everyone. Please, everybody, <laughs> Thank you! Bye! Bye.